I'm going to invite you to take a seat. And uh, I'm not actually going to ask you to turn to a Bible passage this evening because uh, we are doing something a little bit different. We are, uh, this is Halloween weekend, so we're talking about this controversial holiday. Well, it's controversial in church world anyway. And uh, whether you're joining us in the room or whether you're joining us from the Parker campus or whether you're joining us in, from your living room, uh, we're glad that you have decided to join us. We want to talk to you about some of the myths, some of the mistaken ideas about Halloween, about the devil, about hell, uh, and then maybe some good stuff too. Uh, but uh, this is Pastor Robert, who's our family pastor. This is Pastor Pete, who's our life group pastor. And they're going to join me as we're going to discuss some of the things that we have learned and some of the things that we uh, are doing. Hey, Pete, I'm going to ask you to scoot back a little bit because this side over here is I'm just seeing your backside. And even though it's My your good side, side, yeah, I know, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, we, I, I want them to, to be able to see you when you're, when you're talking and sharing anyway. But uh, hey, I don't know about the rest of you, but I grew up in the 60s and 70s and Halloween was just an innocuous holiday, right? We dressed up, we put on costumes, we went trick-or-treating door-to-door, by the way, I'll confess, I had the lamest costumes in the history of the world. Uh, my family didn't do dress up, they didn't do costumes. So I remember one year I wanted to be a ghost, so my mom cut some holes in an old sheet. That didn't work so well, I kept walking into things. Couldn't see out of that. I remember uh, usually I was just a hobo because no one thought of a, a uh, costume until the last minute, so they got some of my dad's old work clothes and put them on me and put dirt on my face, there it was. And I carried around a, a pillowcase to collect candy in, and that's Halloween. You know, just it was no big deal, and you got candy, and because that was a big deal, and that's what we did. And, and that's pretty much how I approached Halloween until uh, I became a youth pastor in Georgia, and the church uh, let me know that Halloween was evil, so we did not celebrate Halloween at all. But we did have a fall festival on October 31st where kids dressed up and we gave out candy. <laughs> so consistent. It, it, was, it was incredibly uh, confusing and a little bit, felt a little bit hypocritical, but... Uh, just a little bit. Anyway, uh, we are uh, celebrating Halloween with our community because uh, Halloween night, 4 to 8 p.m., we're going to be on Main Street in Lake Havasu City, and 5.30 to 7.30, we're going to be at Pop Harvey Park in Parker uh, celebrating Halloween with thousands of unchurched people playing games and giving away candy. Okay, so we're, we're going to be doing that. That's why we, look, by the way, you guys are Crazy generous with the candy. We have got candy upon candy upon candy. So it's going to be a good year uh, for the kids and for the people working the games. Uh, <laughs> and a good year for the dentists. Yeah, and the, well, it's, yeah. So uh, anyway, so we want to talk about Halloween. And we're starting off with the question, uh, look, is Halloween evil? Uh, Robert, what do you think? You know, wh what I find interesting when we were, we were talking about the questions we put together and starting with this, I was like, you know, no one asks if Christians should participate in like Valentine's Day or Fourth of July or other things. It's this Halloween that, that we focus on and kind of demonize in that. And, and I just thought that was kind of an interesting thing to start. But, but to some extent, there's good reason for that. Because when you actually step back, uh, as I did, you know, this, the past couple weeks, because I never actually did that. But as you step back and look at the past of Halloween, it does have a very dark and spiritual past. You know, the, the day we celebrate on, on October 31st, or if you participate, started as this Celtic pagan holiday called Samhain in Northern Ireland and Scotland. And, and this was a day, it was really interesting. They thought that on this particular day as the seasons changed, that there's one day out of the year where the barrier between the physical and the spiritual world didn't exist. That this one night out of the year, spirits could come and go into our world as they pleased. And so they would set out offerings on their porches and they would dress up as animals and monsters to discourage spirit fairies from kidnapping them. Just stop and think about that for a second. Be like, okay, Johnny, make sure you put on your bear costume so you don't get kidnapped by the spirit fairy. Like, this is pretty interesting past. But, you know, what's, what's interesting too, though, is we see in, you know, the 600s AD that the Christian church creates a holiday on November 1st called All Saints Day or All Hallows Day as it sometimes was referred to. And this is a day where the church said, hey, let's honor those that have passed, especially the saints and the leaders of the church, but as Christianity made its way to Ireland and Scotland, these two things kind of collided. So you've got a holiday on the 31st, a holiday on the 1st, 
And all of a sudden, October 31st started to be known as All Hallows' Eve because of the, the prevalence of All Hallows' Day or All Saints' Day on the 1st. And eventually they realized, hey, that's too wordy, that's frustrating, let's just call it Halloween. That's shorter, easier, and, and quicker to remember. And this day was a day where there was some celebration of those that had passed, but some kind of history of the, that pagan holiday with costumes and fires and, and all these you know, different uh, activities. And when we keep going forward, in America, the, the Puritans didn't bring that over. And so Halloween really didn't exist in the United States until there was this massive migration of Irish refugees in the 1800s, and they brought that over as a cultural kind of thing that they had in their life. But from the beginning, it was much more about community and kids and, and, and communities coming together to celebrate than it was about spirits or spirit fairies for that matter, or even honoring the dead. Um, th and, and I think that's where we find ourselves today, that in the United States, people aren't saying, oh, make sure you dress up as a monster so the spirit fairy doesn't get you tonight. They're saying, hey, let's dress up because it's fun. We're having a get together with friends and family. We're eating some candy. The kids are enjoying it. And it's much more about the community and the, the, the children having a day just to have some fun and dress up like kids want to do anyways. Mm -hmm. And so that leads us to the question, should Christians participate? Knowing that the past does have some, some weirdness in it and knowing that, that there is some darkness in its root, should Christians participate? And I think the answer is, is a, a certain yes. Now, the caveat there is we have to be careful as Christians to not honor and glorify things that are sinful or rebellious against God, but the truth is that God has called us to be salt and light in the world, and we can't do that if we're hiding in our houses with the blinds drawn protesting the world. We can only be light if we're in dark places. We can only be salt if we're actually touching the world around us. You know, salt on your table doesn't do any good until it touches your food. And so I believe that we as Christians can let our kids dress up and carve some pumpkins and, and eat a few Snickers and still glorify God in what we're doing. And if we do this, then we can live out Matthew 5, 16, in which Jesus says, therefore let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I think the truth is that the, the lost world doesn't see Christians protesting Halloween as a good work. They don't see us demonizing a day that they think is innocuous as a good work. They do see us loving our community and serving and being generous and, and spending quality time with our friends and family as a good work that potentially can, can lead them to a place of being curious of our faith and where we're at. So that's where I think about, about Halloween. Yes, we can participate while being cautious to not engage in the things that are uh, particularly dishonoring to God in it. I like how you, you said we can demonize the night set aside the demons. So anyway. Yeah. Anyway, don't want to do that. Hey, Pete, what do you take? What's your take on it? No, just to follow up on that, I think we just practice Philippians 4, 8. Whatever is true, noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report, praiseworthy, we want to think on those things. So we can be a light to our community, even if other people might view it as wicked or evil or celebrate something bad, we don't have to do that. We can be positive about it. We can think about what honors God. Okay. Hey, you know, to me, uh, the way we respond as Calvary, and, and by the way, we, we have a response as Calvary, and, and as leaders, we're pretty much in one accord to this, but um, if you have a different viewpoint, we're perfectly fine with that. We're just trying to explain how we approach it and why we approach it the way we do, because we've actually thought through this, but to me, it's a missional engagement with our community. Uh, you know, Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, and uh, honestly, it, it's not just Halloween that uh, has evil roots in our culture. Pretty much our, everything our culture does is evil. I don't know if you guys Especially think about that. Especially in Havasu. That. Well, I don't just mean, ha well, <laughs> Havasu, yeah, you know. Uh, but look, there's not a lot of things that the people who are unchurched, who are ungodly, are, are thinking about, hey, is this going to honor God? And, and they can engage in business in evil ways. They can engage in any kind of celebration, not just Halloween in evil ways. Uh, they can, uh, look, they can get married and, and make it evil. It, it, there's all kinds of evil in our world, which is why people need Jesus. And their only hope is Jesus. And uh, as Robert said, you, we can either lock ourselves away and, and pray against the darkness, or we can go out and live as missionaries in the midst of the craziness. 
And there's different ways you can do that. I mean, I, we, I've been on Main Street now for, you know, over a decade, where, where probably 15 years, where we've been doing this, uh, serving the community. I've seen Christians, you know, carrying crosses up and down the street, kind of being anti-Halloween in the midst of them. Uh, there have been times people were preaching at them with megaphones, uh, and we're up there just, you know, loving their kids, giving them lots and lots of sugar, having them, letting them play some games, not charging them for bounce houses, uh, not charging them for water. And we just do that to represent Jesus. And you know, we've had people come to Calvary because they encountered us on Main Street and said, I think I can go to a church like that. And so we've had people meet Jesus because we went ahead and mixed with our community. And, and by the way, if you're afraid of going down to Main Street because it's too ungodly, Calvary Candyland is a pretty happy place. <laughs> and it's a pretty joyful place. And there's a lot of people who love Jesus and everybody's wearing Calvary shirts. So and we have not... enough candy to line the streets with candy. That's right. We true. won't because we'll get uh, crushed, but uh, we could. It'd melt anyway because it's supposed to be warm tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so that's kind of our, uh, our approach of... of doing this because it's, it, you know, look, churches believe it's a celebration of the devil. That's fine. If you believe it's a celebration of the devil, that's fine. We're going to honor Jesus every single day of the year, and which means uh, on Halloween, we're going to be handing out candy to people and loving on people in Havasu and Parker and any place else that we have a presence. So we're talking about Halloween. And, mm -hmm. and again, there's a lot of churches that think this is a celebration of Satan, so we shouldn't do anything with it. So that begs the question, who is Satan? Is Satan real? Is he, you know, how does, how does he come into play in this? And so I'm going to keep talking since I'm probably the one who's most in touch with my evil side. Uh, <laughs> look, Scripture tells us that Satan was created as an angel, and he decided he wanted to be God. He wanted to rebel against God, and so he was cast out of heaven, and he was dest is destined for hell. Uh, and some people want to go, well, yeah, but, you know, all that spiritual stuff in the Bible, isn't that kind of like, you know, just how they understood it? And we don't really, we're too smart now for spiritual stuff like that. And it's just mental illness. It's not demon possession and everything. Um, so is Satan real and personable? Is evil real and personable? And, and so I just want to start there by reminding you that we're a church where we believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. And the Bible tells us that Satan is real. And here's just two uh, occurrences that I'm going to point to. If you're a follower of Jesus, I think this, this makes sense. Uh, one is Jesus talked to Satan, like had a conversation with Satan. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record the temptation of Jesus where he encountered Satan in a personal form and, and Satan tempted Jesus and Jesus had a conversation with Satan, rebuked Satan, all of that. Okay, so that's, that's one uh, occurrence. And obviously, Jesus told his disciples about that. They recorded it. Uh, the second reason that, you know, Satan is real, the evil is personal, is because of the pigs. Because of pigs. Now, I'm not saying pigs are satanic, although some people would think that, that they are. But I'm talking about what happened to the pigs in, in the story of Jesus and the demoniac. It's recorded in Mark, the Gospel of Mark chapter 5, Gospel of Luke chapter 8. And, and Jesus is casting the demons out of the sky, and, and they beg him to be merciful. The demons beg Jesus to be merciful and to send them into a herd of pigs instead of sending them to Abaddon. And Jesus says, okay, you can go into the pigs. Now, the pigs are just grazing peacefully on the hillside. And next thing you know, they're running like, you know, mad pigs down into the lake and drowning. So what happened to the pigs? If you think that all those biblical stories are just about mental illness and Jesus healing people with mental illness, then what happened to the pigs? Did Jesus just not like pork? <laughs> you know, not, I don't think that's the case. I mean, he created it. So, so uh, look, I'm just going to tell you that, that Satan is real. The Bible describes him as real. He's an enemy of the church. He's called the accuser of the brethren. He is the adversary. He's the one who, uh, Jesus said, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. He's a thief who comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Now, uh, I, I grew up around Christians that were kind of afraid of Satan. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, Satan's against me. And I'm like, okay, the Bible also describes Satan as a defeated general. Okay, he's destined for hell. He's already lost the battle. The war has been won. Okay, so, uh, look, Satan wants to destroy your life. 
and he has only two tools if you're a follower of Jesus. Okay, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus as your Savior, can I just tell you, Satan can't touch you, but he can make you an idiot. Okay, he can't touch you, he can't control you, but he can deceive you. Jesus said, you're a murderer from the beginning, and you're the father of lies. Can I just tell you that Satan's a liar, and he's a really, really good one? And we're a, a bunch of people who are buying his lies. And, and so we, we neglect the truth of God, and we, you know, take hold of the lies that Satan is selling. And, and so those lies lead us to destruction. Satan doesn't destroy us, he deceives us, and we destroy ourselves because we take hold of that which is not true. So Satan wants to tell you that uh, you'd be happier with that woman, you know, that isn't your wife than the one who's your wife because he wants to destroy your family. Satan's going to tell you that you should compromise your ethics so that you can make more money because you'll be happier if you have more money and, and lead you to a life of selfish greed and, and no joy in that. You know, Satan tells you that, you know, you got to live for the weekend and party hardy and, and, you know, drink until you black out because that's going to, you know, bring you joy. It's not. It's just going to destroy your life. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And if you, and here's the thing, we all know that, but we don't know the truth well enough to know the lies. Here, here's what Jesus said in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. You should look it up. If you remain in my word... If you remain in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth. You guys know the rest of this, don't you? And the truth will do what? The truth will set you free. But you have to know the truth for the truth to set you free. And, and so many times we're like, yeah, the truth will set us free. If only I knew it. By the way, that's why we give Bibles away. If you're sitting in the room here at Sweetwater and you don't have a Bible, take one of those. It's a gift to you. If you're in Parker, there's Bibles sitting on the table in the middle uh, of the room in the back. You just take one of those if you want it, but just do me a favor and read it. Because if you read and apply God's Word, then God will change your life. Now, uh, so that, that's what uh, the, other, the other power that Satan has over us, by the way, is not just lies, but fear. He wants to make you afraid. Because if you're afraid, you won't do anything. You won't do anything for Jesus. You won't do anything for freedom. You'll just be stuck in fear. Man, has he been on a rampage these last 18 months, hasn't he? Yes. I mean, there are people who are so afraid. And, and God doesn't want you to be afraid. You know, the only person we're told to be afraid of is God. And if you're afraid of God, then you understand that he loves you and he's for you and you're going to do what he says. The truth will set you free. Now, I'm just talking a whole lot, uh, but I want to remind you, the devil can't control you, but he can influence you, he can harass you, he can tempt you. And Pete, what else can he do? Well, one of the lies that we believe is that he's equal to God, right? We think of the cartoons, and you know, Satan's on one side encouraging us to do bad, God's on the other side encouraging us to be good. Or whenever something bad happens in our life, we blame Satan, and then when something good happens, we give God credit. And I think that's a lie because we are equating Satan and God. We're making their powers equal. And the Bible teaches that God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. Mm. Um, God is sovereign. And God is everywhere. Satan is none of those things. So Satan is limited by God. You know, his power is very limited by God. And then, you know, you brought up the temptation of Jesus and the Word of God. That's how Jesus defeats Satan, yeah. is with the Word of God. So Satan is limited by God's power and limited by God's Word. Yeah. Well, yeah. if the devil is real, that begs the next question. Is hell real? Is hell real? And if so, what is it like? So, again, we're a church that believes the Bible, uh, and the New Testament references hell. Oh, yeah, I should have you guys like write down a number. Like, how many times do you think the New Testament, just the New Testament, references hell? All right, lean over and tell the person next to you. Pick a number. Come on, loser buys dinner. So no one, no one wants to pick a number. Okay, 162 times. Anybody get that? 162 times the New Testament references hell. Okay, out of those 162 times, how many times do you think Jesus referenced hell? Now you can pick another number, write it down again. It's 70 times, okay? 
70 times Jesus refers to hell. I mean, he talks about the Sermon on the Mount. There's two paths. The, the way is broad and the path is easy that leads to destruction, but the path is narrow that leads to life and few find it. Uh, he talks about it in Matthew 10 when he says, don't fear the one who can kill just the body, but rather fear the one who has the power to cast both body and soul into hell. He talks about it in Matthew 25 in the parable of the sheep and the goats when he says, depart from me, you accursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And of course, Revelations 20. Uh, the devil is cast into the lake of fire, and by the way, everyone whose name is not found in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. Uh, so, Robert, talk to us about some of the myths of hell. Yeah, uh, there's two myths that I've heard a lot uh, from people of all ages, you know, in ministry. The first myth is that those that go to hell just cease to exist. And this is an annihilist view of hell, that people that, that don't go to heaven, they go to hell, but that, that's kind of the end, that there's not this, this long-standing eternal existence there that is just kind of poof, the end for them. And it makes a lot of sense when we step back and look at, okay, why do people, why, why have we fabricated this myth? Because when you think about it, it's a lot more comfortable for us to think about, you know, especially people that we know who haven't had a relationship with Christ, it's a lot more comfortable to us to think about them just not existing than to be in a place of eternal torment and suffering um, and, and pain. But unfortunately, when we look at those explanations, those 162 in the New Testament plus those in the Old, like it talks about how there is an eternal existence and it is a place of eternal suffering and torment and, and pain. And so we can't just say, well, you have eternal afterlife with heaven, but if, the, if hell is the destination, it's just kind of poof the end um, because it's not actually kind and loving because we don't allow people to fully understand the gravity of their spiritual decisions. And the second myth that, that I've heard so much is that, that hell is some sort of like party for those not good enough to get to heaven. And this shows up in everything from movies to country songs and everything in between that, that, you know, hell is this sort of like combination between like burning man and a nightclub and the devil's your wingman like navigating you all through it. And, and, and this shows up in so many different ways. And again, we understand it when we think about it because the people that are saying, hey, I don't wanna have anything to do with God because I love my life of sin and rebellion against God. But Again, the Bible says that hell is a place of eternal suffering and torment and separation from God. And that last part's really important because James 1.17 says that, that God is the giver of all good and perfect things in our life. And so if we, if we realize that, hey, all of the joy, all the relationships, all the community, all the pleasure that we experience in our life here and, and all of those things that we hope to find in the life that's to come in the afterlife come from God, that means that none of those things will be present in hell because we're eternally separated from God and all of his blessings in our life. So if we want fun, if we want relationship, we want community, we want pleasure in the afterlife that's only found in heaven, we're not going to find that in the place of hell because God is not there. God is not bringing blessings of goodness and joy and relationship and community uh, in that place. And, and since hell is such a bad place, then we tend to think it's unloving for us to talk about it. Yeah. Right? We don't want to bring it up to people, so we kind of ignore that topic. But if you think about uh, raising your kids and think about having toddlers, you know, we did a really good job of trying to keep our toddlers from running in the street because we knew what was coming if they just ran out there and they got hit by a car. That would be the worst thing for a parent to experience, a terrible thing for a toddler to experience. And so we talk to our kids about the danger. We warn them, and sometimes we even scare them with that. And of course, a parent would even be willing to run out into that street to remove their child and get them to safety, even if it costs the parent their life, right? Because that's a parent's love. And um, I think of Jesus and what he did on the cross. He did that to save us from the punishment and the, the suffering of hell. And so whenever we talk about hell, you know, we're warning in love and we're giving the remedy, right? Jesus yeah. Christ is the remedy to protect us from that place. Yeah. So Satan is real, hell is real, and terrible. And that begs the question, what is heaven like? So uh, Pete, you wanna, you, you know, talk well, about loving to, to talk about hell. So talk about some of the myths about heaven. 
Well, I think if we view hell as the party place, then we automatically sometimes view heaven as the boring place, right? It's like I'm going to wear white, and I'm going to be on a cloud floating around, and I'm going to play a harp. And Sounds like hell. Yeah. <laughs> the, the most enjoyable thing we have to do is sing a song. Um, and singing is great, but the Bible paints a much better picture of heaven. In John 14, Jesus describes heaven as a mansion where there's rooms for everybody. Mm. You know, so we have this picture of um, everyone who trusts in Jesus having a home in heaven, right? A place where we belong, a place where we're comfortable. Uh, in Revelations 21, uh, you, you hear about the new heaven and the new earth, and it's described as a city, right? And the most beautiful city that you've ever seen, right? And so being in a city, that gives you the idea of having activities to do, uh, people to be around, uh, and it's a beautiful place. Um, Revelation 22 talks about there being a river in heaven and trees in heaven. Uh, if you look at Isaiah, it talks about the lion laying down with the lamb and uh, the little tiny child playing with snakes. I mean, it's... Don't do snakes. <laughs> in heaven, <laughs> you'll be able to. Wait, wait, that's just a, How many of you, that, that passage in Isaiah about the, the baby playing with the vipers uh, freaks you out? Come on, go ahead and admit it. Go ahead and admit it. Okay, you're like, the only good snake is a dead snake, right? Amen. See, that's a fallen... <laughs> broken picture because heaven's so radically different that even the things in this world that bring you terror yeah. will bring you joy. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that. that's great. So, so, you know, you've got nature in, in heaven, right? So um, it's either a zoo or a countryside. I don't know which one, but it's going to be a place where there's a lot of things for us to do, a lot of things for us to enjoy. So you've got uh, countryside, you've got city, and you've got a home, right? So I look at it, if you're a city girl, a country boy, or a homebody, you're going to be happy <laughs> in heaven, okay? There's going to be something for you. Uh, hey, you were talking about a book that you found really helpful as uh, you yeah. had studied heaven. Uh, you want to recommend that? Yeah, so uh, Randy Alcorn has a book called Heaven. And uh, it's a great book, and there's actually two versions. There's an adult version that's really thick. So if you're a voracious reader, you can pick that up. Or if you're like me, you can pick up the kid's version, which is also really good and very deep. Lots of good stuff in there. A lot of stuff from C.S. Lewis. Okay. And you can read that version, but it's by Randy Alcorn, Heaven. Okay. Okay. Hey, so Heaven is variety and beauty beyond anything that we've ever experienced in this world. Uh, when people talk to me about heaven and what's it going to be like, I always say, well, uh, just imagine the most beautiful place you've ever been in, on earth, okay? So everybody just do that. Just imagine, what, you know, what's the most beautiful place and moment you've ever been on earth, okay? So you, you picture that in your mind and then realize that that will pale in comparison to anything in heaven. All of heaven is going to be more beautiful than the most beautiful thing or place on earth. Uh, so it, it's just going to be amazing. And then... People ask about, you know, what are we going to look like in heaven, right? Because we're all vain, and, and we all want to know, am I going to look like my best self, or, you know, am I going to be tall and thin, yeah, you know, saying right now that they're not, uh, and, you know, they're going to they're gonna know. And so I always tell them, well, in my mind, we're all going to be four feet tall and 400 pounds. Because <laughs> maybe God thinks bowling balls are the most beautiful thing in the world, and, uh, and so we're all going to, no. See, here's the thing. We, we don't know what we're going to look like, and we won't care what we're going to look like. Let me say that again. We're not going to care because there's no more vanity. Ooh, none whatsoever. I wonder if there'll be mirrors in heaven. Anyway, no more vanity. No more, no more dissatisfaction when you look in the mirror. Can you even fathom that? That you, if there are mirrors, you'll look in the mirror and you'll smile because of God's creation. No more self-loathing. We're going to be perfectly content in a new creation because Revelation tells us there's no more suffering, sorrow, death, or pain. But there's also not going to be any more politics or judging one another or lying or fear of, of what you might be. And, and by the way, you will recognize your family and your friends because heaven is a place that, com that we're, we're complete. That's what it means, perfect. When you read perfect in Scripture, it means that we're complete, whole, everything that God intended us to be, which is more than we are right now. So we're going we're gonna to kind of go up a step for what we were intended to be, not what we are. 
That's, that's part of that redemption. And you're going to know your friends. You're going to know your family. And that's going to be great. And, and I, I just want to point this out. This is in contrast to uh, the eternity of other world religions. So Muslims, you know, their, their idea of heaven is sort of like a, a frat boy's party place. Uh, Hindus and Buddhists, you just kind of get absorbed into the cosmic jello and you cease to have personhood. See, Jesus' view of eternal life elevates you, but also finds you in that perfect place in the presence of God. And Robert, I know you wanted to talk about that whole relationship. Well, well, before that, I think you just skimmed over a little too quickly. There's no politics in heaven, and that, oh. that makes it a lot more enticing, I think, for all of us now. But All the yeah. politics will be in hell. Uh, <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, uh. You know, one of the things that I think we, we need to remember as well, you know, Pete, I loved what you said about just the, the beauty and the enjoyment factor of heaven and, and the completeness there, but also, like, the, the primary thing that we have to look forward to in heaven that sometimes we don't fully grasp, I think, because we don't have a capacity to, is just the fact that, that we have perfect relationship and community with our Savior. Mm-hmm. That whatever purpose and satisfaction and joy we find in following Jesus here, pales in comparison to the, the satisfaction and joy we find or we will find in heaven in that place. And, and Pete referenced several uh, aspects of Revelation 21. The beginning of that chapter says, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them. Mm. That, that we will find just an incredible amount of joy and satisfaction and meaning by being able to, to be in the actual presence of God And I think that that will be so overwhelming that the other stuff really won't matter. What we look like or what activities will be there, like that will all be great, but the the real reality that we have to look forward to is the perfect connection with God that we've never been able to experience here because we've only seen God through our broken, sinful life and and way of being here. Hmm. Well, we, uh, we hope and pray that this has been helpful in terms of giving you a a little bit of information about Halloween, about Satan, about hell, and about heaven. If you have further questions, look, we love to to answer them as best we can. Uh, So you can email them, you can schedule an appointment with us uh, or any of the pastors. We'd be glad to to talk about this further because uh, we we want us to know the truth so we can live the truth and so we can represent the truth because we're celebrating Halloween in order to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Even though the devil is real, even though hell is real, but hey, hell is real, but we know we're not going there, and we don't want anyone else to go there either. Okay? So the only way to heaven is for you to experience that life-changing relationship with Jesus, for you to fully surrender to him and acknowledge that you're a sinner and that you need Jesus to save you. And if you've never done that, then... We want to invite you to do that today. Like right now, just simply say, Jesus, I need you, and I want you to change my life. I want you to be in control of my life. I give up, and I need you to save me. And he will do that. He'll do that whether you're in the room here at Sweetwater, whether you're in the room at Parker, or whether you're watching from your living room or your bedroom. He will save you because he wants you to be in heaven with him. He came into this world to rescue us from hell. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for the whole gospel story that even though we were sinners, even though we rebelled against you, defied you, and entered into self-destruction, you decided that we were valuable enough to save. And so Jesus entered this world uh, helpless and weak. He lived a perfect life, sinless in all aspects, and then gave himself willingly to be a sacrifice for our sin. Father, we want to live for you. We want to be the people that represent you uh, to this world in a way that leads them to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So teach us how to do that. Draw us into the truth so that we can defeat the, the enemy with his lies and with his fear. And we can live boldly, we can live righteously, we can live humbly in the midst of people who are desperate to know you. Father, we love you. Thank you again for loving us and giving us life in your Son. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.